Now, imagine if you could, um, a day kind of like we had yesterday, a, a beautiful fall day, the sun is shining, there's a little cool crispness to the air, but it's still warm enough to be outside, and anybody get outside yesterday? Who, who raked leaves yesterday? Anybody rake some leaves? Like, it's that time of year where you got to get those leaves to the street, because in Tosa, all of the leaf piles are piling up, and the city's going to come take them away. So imagine yesterday, you're outside, beautiful day, raking leaves, and you look down your block as you're working. And what you notice is that there are two individuals coming down your street, wearing white short sleeve button-up shirts with a tie and a name tag on a backpack, and they're going house to house to house. Right? I can tell. You're like, I know who those people are, right? Probably Jehovah's Witnesses. So if that's the case, they're coming down your block. You notice that. What do you do? What do you do, right? Do you run to the backyard and you're like, I'm going to keep working, but I'm going to go to the backyard so they'll pass right by my house and hopefully leave me alone. Do you run inside, close the blinds, turn off the lights, and then peek through the blinds? <laughs> and wait till they pass by, right? Or do you actually engage with them? What do you do? Like, if I'm honest with myself, I'm probably taking option one. Like, I want to continue to be productive. I don't want to slow down my productivity, but I'm going to the backyard so I don't have to engage with them. What, what do you do in those scenarios? Uh, there's a pastor speaker and author by the name of Francis Chan kind of like blew up in 2008 because he wrote this book called Crazy Love and he was getting asked to speak all over the place and go across the world and speak at conferences and he told this story of one time for him that happened. He was outside in his front yard working and these Jehovah's Witness come by and we have a clip of this story that he tells and how he engaged with them. Uh, I'm going to play this clip, but it's a, it's a little bit of an older clip. It's a little, you know, hard to see some of it. But at least you'll be able to hear this story that he tells for how he engages with some people when they come to evangelize him. Go ahead and take a look. Just a few months ago, I was working in my front yard fixing some things, and some Jehovah's Witnesses come by, and they say, hey, can we talk to you? And I'm fixing this, of course. How can I? Yeah, I, I got some things to say to you too. You know, let's 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 talk. No, seriously, because I I just think here's some human beings. I I need to love on them. They're trying to love on me, and and so they start sharing some things. And I just said, hey, can I tell you? Can I? I just tell you a couple things that God's done in my life recently. Just just a couple things. I mean, this will blow your mind. Let me just tell you about some answers to prayer that just happened like last week. And this lady goes, you know, God doesn't listen to everyone's prayers. And I said, you know what? Actually, biblically, you're right on. I go, James 1 says that if we doubt, he's not going to listen to us. James 4 says if, if we ask with the wrong motives, he's not going to listen to us. 1 Peter 3 says if I don't honor my wife, man, my, my prayers are going to be hindered. He, he says in Isaiah 58, if I don't care for the poor, it doesn't mean if I fast and pray, he's not listening. Yeah, I go in Amos, he says, ah, oh, I don't even want to hear the noise of your songs. You, you know, I'm not going to listen to that. He, he says if my people would humble themselves, you know, and, and turn from their wicked ways. I mean, there's conditions says you're absolutely right he does not listen to every prayer but he listens to mine and I, and I, and I said and I I tell this one story of this thing that happened and she's like wow I go explain that why does he listen to me you know and 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 she goes let's get out of here and so her and her friends start walking away. I go actually if you don't mind, I'd like to walk with you because I have some more stories. And uh, because I didn't want them to just walk away. I want them to know, I just want people to know this Jesus because there's nothing like answered prayer. There's nothing like, no way. I just spoke to God and he listened to me. I mean, that's my favorite thing on earth. When I ask for something, I go, shut up. God just listen to me and look what he did you can't explain this away and so I'm telling them these stories as I'm walking with them man I went like a block and a half just telling them and and one of them looks at me she goes she goes what are you because you one of them Pentecostals <laughs> and I go don't worry about it I, I go 
here's all you need to know about me. I'm a human being just like you. And I get alone with that book. I get alone with the Bible and I just read it and, and, and I see stuff I'm supposed to do and I do it and I, and I pray to that God in that Bible, that Jesus who died on that cross for me. And, and I, just, I, I just read that and I pray to him and he listens to me and he's changed me and, and everything he's done in my life, I, it just blows my mind. Story. Yeah, great story of how he engaged with people who are trying to evangelize him. Now, we're in this series called This is Meadowbrook. And what we're doing in this series is we're looking at our mission statement as a way to remind ourselves of who we are as a church, and at the same time, looking at stories from the early church for how they did the same thing that our mission statement says we're called to do. And if you've never seen our mission statement, it's this, that Meadowbrook Church exists to invite people to discover Jesus and become his fully devoted followers who influence the world. And we say that there are four words that kind of carry the weight of that statement. Those four words are invite, discover, become, and influence. And this week, we're specifically looking at influence. What does it mean for us to influence our world, and how do we go about doing it? Now, the, the video we showed is, is a fun video. It's a funny story. He does a great job telling that story, but it raises the question, is that the best way to influence people. And not so much Francis Chan's response to them, because he's just responding to people who show up, but people who make impromptu house calls, right? Is that the best philosophy or strategy to simply show up uninvited? And, and it's not just the Jehovah's Witness who do this. There are plenty of Christians who, over the years, who have done the exact same thing. But when somebody shows up in your world unannounced and uninvited, like you naturally get defensive, right? Like we live in a day and age where people won't even pick up a phone call unless somebody tells them through a text message, hey, I'm going to call you, right? Even if you have that person's number saved in your phone, even if that person is a member of your family, and when they call, there's this beautiful picture of them that pops up on the screen. When they do, and you're like, I didn't know anybody was going to call me today. All of a sudden, you're suspicious. Like, is something wrong? Is everything okay? I mean, this could be one of your closest friends. You're like, hello? Like, everything all right? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm just calling to check in. Like, sometimes we get offended, right? You were supposed to text me. There's this unwritten etiquette. You're supposed to text me before you call me, let alone if somebody shows up to your house and knocks on the door and you don't know they're coming. That's the world we live in. So it raises the question, is that the best strategy in philosophy when it comes to influencing people for the sake of the kingdom? How are we called to do that? Well, our passage today in Acts 8 kind of gives us a snapshot of how we could go about influencing somebody for the sake of the gospel, and perhaps it might be a more effective way. This is how our passage begins. This is Acts 8, starting <clears throat> in verse 26. We read, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now Mark 8 marks, a, or excuse me, Acts 8 marks a significant shift in the story of Acts. Philip is a deacon who is part of the first deacon group called in Acts 6. And when you cross over into Acts 8, it's a new mark where the call of the disciples is to go to the ends of the earth. All the way up to Acts chapter 7 and through 7, the action and activity in the book of Acts is all happening in Jerusalem. But the call is to go to the ends of the earth. And the way that it's stated in Acts 1, Jesus tells his disciples before he ascends back to the Father, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, but also in Samaria and Judea, all the way to the utter ends of the earth. And so you find as you enter into Acts 8, there's this spread of the gospel away from Jerusalem. And when Acts 8 opens up, the next progression of that movement is Samaria, and Philip is in Samaria when Acts 8 begins. And what happens when Philip goes to Samaria is that there is a full 
on spiritual revival that takes place. If we were to back up a few verses to Acts 8 verse 9, this is what we read. Now, for some time a man named Simon, this is not Simon Peter, this is a different Simon, had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people. Take note of that phrase, all the people. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. Verse 11, they. Now, who does the they refer to? This is a, for you English majors, this is a reference to an antecedent, right? The they refers to all the people, right? Not some of the people, not certain groups of people. How many of the people? All the people. So they, all the people, followed him, being Simon, because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. Verse 12, but, but is a contrast word. It means something different is about to happen. But when they, and who's the they? All the people. How many of the people? All the people. When they believed, when all the people believed. I mean, do you see how massive that is? Like, wherever he was in this town, all the people believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and they, again, all the people were baptized, both men and women. So that means Philip is in the midst of this amazing revival, a spiritual awakening, awakening, and he's at the center of it. It's happening in and through him. This revival is so big that word gets back to Jerusalem of what's happening, and as you keep reading through Acts chapter 8, Peter and John come to check it out. Like, they're the two lead guys, and they're like, we got to go see what's happening. And they're amazed. And what makes this moment even that much more incredible is who are the Samaritans in relation to Israel? They are their enemies. Their enemies, Samaritans and Jews, don't get along. So Philip is going into enemy territory, proclaiming the good news, and all the people of this town are converting to Christianity, bringing peace between these two groups of people and coming into the kingdom. And what God is saying here in verse 26, it says, now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south. He's telling him to leave. He's saying, leave all of this spiritual activity and go where I tell you. And notice where the angel of the Lord tells him to go. He doesn't give him a destination. He gives him a direction. He says, go south. Now, he does say on the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza, but he doesn't say go to Gaza. He says just go south in that direction. He's not giving a destination. He's giving a general direction. And notice the descriptor of the road, right? It's highlighted. What kind of road is it? It's a desert road. But he's leaving the epicenter of this spiritual awaken, awakening. All of this spiritual energy, people coming to faith, a revival happening, and he's supposed to leave and go to the desert without any specific direction on where he's going or what he's going to do. Because God doesn't say, I want you to go here and I want you to do this and I want you to meet these people. He just says, go south. Now, if I'm Philip, and that happens to me, I've got all sorts of questions. Where? Where am I going? Why? Why am I going there? Who? Who am I going to meet there? What's going to happen? I'm probably even resisting this. But what does Philip do? Verse 27, so he started out. He went. Philip enters into this moment with willing obedience, having no idea where he's going or what he's going to do, except he's headed on a desert road south of Jerusalem. Uh, There's a guy by the name of David Rock. He started the Neuro Leadership Institute, which tries to study leadership management skills alongside brain science and see how the two things go together. And he developed something called the SCARF model. He says that these five things we instinctively are trying to attain all the time. They just are part of what it means to be human to obtain these five things. Status, certainty, autonomy, relationship, and fairness. 
And what he says in studying this and how the brain works in relation to these things, when these, things, fi these five things are either challenged or threatened or taken from us, our brain responds in a similar way as if our life was in danger. So meaning, your brain responds the same way if you're on a boat and that boat starts to sink as it would if you're at, at a job and you get passed over because of a, for a promotion and your sense of status is wrapped up in your job, your brain responds in similar ways. So when certainty in your life is threatened, your brain responds as though your life is at stake. Anybody like certainty in their life? I love certainty in my life. But when your certainty is challenged, it can be very disorienting. Like, for example, uh, just this week, my neighbor called me and said, hey, Brian, can you help me move a mattress upstairs? Right? They had just had their second kid last week. Uh, their house is one of those small Tosa homes that had an unfinished attic. So they finished the attic so that they could have two bedrooms downstairs for their two kids, and then they could go upstairs, and they don't have to like move to another home. So they finished their attic, and they're time to move their mattress back up. So I'm like, yeah, this is a job that should take five minutes, right? So we get there. We have the, the mattress like up on its side like this to go up the stairway. We get two stairs up, and the thing is stuck. It's just stuck. I mean, it's like pushing a watermelon through a three-inch pipe. Like, it's going nowhere. And he starts to get a little anxious and unsettled. And he starts to, like, sit on top of the mattress. He, like, gets up on a chair, sits on top of the mattress as I'm pushing up the mattress. I mean, it is not moving. And he starts to panic. And he starts to pace. And he starts to swear. And he's like, oh, what the, what's going on? And I'm like, it's just a mattress. And so, but we keep going. It takes us 30 minutes 30 minutes to get this thing up. And what he says to me when he's done, he has this great sense of relief. He's like, all I saw was dollar signs. Like, we just spent all of this money to redo our attic and finish it out. And I was thinking, I'm going to have to go buy more, spend more money to buy a new mattress. And it was just causing him panic because his certainty was challenged. He, as did I, think it was going to take us three minutes to get this thing up. He was certain it would fit. And his certainty was challenged, and it caused him to panic. When we find ourselves in moments where certainty is challenged, it can be very disorienting. That's why kids are always asking questions. If you go out on errands with your kids for an hour and a half, like, hey, where are we going? How long is it going to take us to get there? Who's going to be there when we get there? If it's around lunchtime, they're going to be like, are we eating on the way? Are we eating when we get home? What time are we going to be home? Do I have to take a nap when I get home? Like, kids just always ask questions because they're trying to achieve certainty. And when your certainty is challenged, it can be very disorienting. Philip obeys the Spirit. He willingly steps into uncertainty. All he's told is go south on a desert road, maybe leading to nowhere. And then, as he steps willingly into uncertainty, this is what happens. Continue on in verse 27. On his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of the Candake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. So Philip is walking south down this desert road to nowhere, and all of a sudden this chariot comes along and passes him. Now, at this moment in the story, we, the reader, know more about who's in the chariot than Philip does. We are told more information than Philip has at this point. We know the guy in the chariot is an Ethiopian, right? He's a high-ranking official. He's basically the queen of Ethiopia's CFO, and he went to Jerusalem to worship, which means he traveled thousands of miles from where he's from to Jerusalem. He's a serious seeker. And on his way home, he's still seeking because he's reading the book of Isaiah, which means he has his own copy, which is no small thing in the ancient world. To have your own copy of a text like that would be hard to come by and very expensive. He spent lots of money, lots of energy, and lots of time to go to Jerusalem to worship God, and no doubt he would have gone to the temple. 
because that's where God's presence dwelt, the Israelites thought. That's where God lives. And so if you want to go worship God, you go to the temple. But you got to wonder if his trip to Jerusalem was disappointing. Because if he did go to the temple, he most likely would not have been allowed in. This is a picture of how the temple would have been structured in the first century world in Jerusalem. The, the big rectangle around the outside is the wall uh, of the area that encases the temple. That's not the temple wall itself. It's a wall that surrounds the temple. Inside that rectangle, rectangle you have another rectangle going perpendicular. That is the temple. And all of the space in between was known as the court of the Gentiles, meaning Gentiles were allowed in the wall, but they weren't allowed in the temple. Jews were supposed to maintain separation from Gentiles. Gentiles most likely would not be allowed in the temple. It also explicitly says in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 23, that eunuchs are not allowed in the temple. This guy traveled great distance to go worship God. No doubt would have gone to the temple to find, because he's a Gentile and he's a eunuch, he was probably not allowed in. And so he's going home, probably somewhat dejected, feeling as though he's denied from entering in to God's presence. So he's Philip's walking down this south road. This chariot drives by, this man on his way home from a long trip to Jerusalem. And then the Spirit tells this to Philip, verse 29. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now, come to grips with how awkward of an instruction this is, right? Philip's walking, chariot goes by him, and the Lord says, go follow that chariot, which means he's got to run up to that chariot, right? And then it says, stay with it. So he's got to run alongside this chariot, and there's this guy in the chariot reading his text, and probably somewhere along the way, he notices this person shows up right next to him and just trotting along, and he probably looks like, who's this guy? And what is Philip supposed to do? He's just running, and he's like, hey. <laughs> Like, like God doesn't give him any instruction. He doesn't even tell him who's in the chariot. Just go to that chariot, stay with it. And again, if I'm Philip, I'm like, what? But what does he do? Verse 30, then Philip ran up to the chariot. See, sometimes when God calls us into a place to influence people, it means we're going to have to step into uncertainty. It means we're going to have to step into uncomfortable situations. And at times, it might even feel awkward. But all along the way, Philip is willing and obedient. And then the next thing that he does here is he listens because it says, Philip ran up to the chariot and heard. He heard. He enters into this situation in an incredible posture of obedience and he is quick to listen. He's listening both to the Holy Spirit, and now in this moment, he's listening to the eunuch. If we want to influence people, one of the best starting points is to listen to them, to listen to their stories, listen to their questions, listen to their experiences in, the, in life, listen to their view of the world. Listening is actually an act of love. It takes intention and effort, and it means we have to be willing to step outside of ourselves, our comfort zone, our own world, to enter into somebody else's and just listen to who they are and what's going on in their world. The thing that prevents us from listening is oftentimes being wrapped up and caught up in our own self-interest. So this summer, our family took a trip to Devil's Lake for the day. We went there to go walk around the lake, swim, just spend the day as a family. And as we're driving home, we're going through some little small town, and I recognize that Culver's headquarters is in this small town. And we're driving by. I'm driving. Kate's sitting in the front seat with me. And she goes, ah, oh, Culver's. And she says it in a way like she wants to stop there and get something to eat. And I say, yeah, that's Culver's. I'm like, but 
But we can't stop there. That's their headquarters. It's not an actual store or a restaurant. So we're just going to keep going. And she goes, no, Culver's, like this. <laughs> and I'm like, that's, that's a strange gesture. And she's speaking louder. And well, I'm not sure what this has to do with that. But I re reiterate to her, like, that, that's not a restaurant. We can't stop there. And she does it again. She's like, dad, Culver's. And I'm like, something is amiss. We are communicating like this, clearly. And what she's actually saying is not Culver's. She's saying ravens. And the reason she's pointing like this is she's pointing to these birds in the sky. And I'm like, oh, ravens. Now, we're sitting two feet apart, like from here to here. Like you would think that we would be able to hear something as simple as a distinction between Culver's and ravens. But the problem was we both had our earbuds in. She was listening to music. I was listening to a podcast, and neither one of us thought to like take our earbuds out so we could better hear the person. And there was a point in the conversation we just both looked at each other like, "You're a moron! Like, <laughs> what are you, what are you talking about?" And we just completely ignored each other, and we went on our way, knowing we were talking about two totally different things. If we want to listen to people, we have to step outside of our own self-interest. We have to put ourselves in their shoes. We might even have to make ourselves uncomfortable. And we have to start not only just listening, but growing in the skill of asking good questions. Because that's what Philip does next. Not only does he listen, but he also asks questions. Verse 30 says, he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And then Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? See, he could have assumed, oh, this guy's not a Jew. He probably has no idea what he's reading and just bulldozed his way into the conversation. But there's a sensitivity to his question. He could have assumed, but instead of assuming, he asks. And the way that you grow in your skill of asking questions is you practice curiosity. You start to wonder about things and about people. And once you start to grow curious, you will naturally start asking good questions. And when you listen, and when you get curious, and you ask good questions, what will then happen is you will be invited in. You won't have to push your way in. You will be invited in, and that's exactly what happens to Philip here. Because the eunuch responds saying this in verse 31, how can I? Like, how can I understand what I'm reading? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. There's a similar strategy happening here to what Jesus does and says with the disciples when he sends them out in the Gospels. There's this passage in Luke 10 where Jesus is sending out the 72 and he gives them the instruction, hey, go to the places and specifically go to the people who welcome you. To say that in another way would be, go to the people who invite you in. And it's not just go to the people and go to the places where you're invited and welcomed, but go to the places and people where you are also served. He says in Luke 10, when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat whatever's offered to you. Meaning as you go into a town, you're going to look for these people who welcome you in and are willing to serve you. It's an image of receiving hospitality. And Jesus says, if that doesn't happen, if you're not welcomed and invited and served, shake the dust off your feet and move on. Don't waste your time and your energy with people who aren't willing to receive you. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, don't throw your pearls before swine. Don't throw your pearls before pigs, which is kind of a weird image. Not quite as weird as pigs wearing pearls, but who's going to go out with something as, you know, nice and fancy and expensive as pearls and start throwing them to pigs? Nobody's going to do that. Why? Because you're not going to throw something valuable to somebody who won't appreciate it. And what Jesus is saying with that image is you have the value of the kingdom. You have the riches of the kingdom. And if somebody's just going to trample on that and not value it, don't spend your energy extending it to them if they're not wanting to receive it. So he's saying, just move on and look for places and look for people where you're invited. If they welcome you, the point being, if they serve you, there's a better chance that they're probably going to listen to you. 
Because yes, you do need to listen. You do need to ask good questions, but somewhere along the way, you also have to speak. You also have to be able to tell the truth. And you also have to know that you have something so good that they are going to want. And that's what happens next. Verse 32. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Verse 34. Then the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. See, being present, being curious, and being a good listener is all great, but there does come a point in which we need to speak, and the text tells us here that what it is that Philip speaks is the good news. It's not shame. It's not condemnation. It's not judgment. It's not you should have and you ought to. It's the good news of Jesus. And the passage that the eunuch is reading is Isaiah 53. In Isaiah, there are these four passages that are called the servant songs. There's four passages about this servant, this individual who is thought to come in the future, who would be and do for Israel and the world what we and Israel couldn't be and do for ourselves, namely be a savior and a servant to bring us into his kingdom. And the way that this servant was going to enact this salvation was by laying down his life. Laying down his life and taking all the judgment, all the brokenness, all the pain, all the dysfunction, all of the sin of the entire world on himself. And then he was going to step into new life after his death, step into new life through his resurrection and launch for all of eternity a new creation project that is going to swallow up this dead, dysfunctional world that we live in. That's the good news that Philip tells him. And it says here that beginning with this passage in Isaiah 53, which probably means from there he goes on to talk about Isaiah 54 and Isaiah 55 and Isaiah 56, because it's all part of this good news proclamation and vision that Isaiah is casting for the people. And what's interesting is here in Isaiah 53. If you were to go back and read it in the Old Testament, the wording is a little bit different than here. Verse 33 says, In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. I wouldn't be surprised if Philip knew that in the Old Testament, in the original, it was actually not for his life was taken from the earth, but he was cut off from the land of the living. And if there's anybody who understood what it means to be cut off from people, it would be the eunuch. Because he would just have been in Jerusalem. And he would have tried to get into the temple, but he would have been cut off. His access would have been denied. And when it says that Philip began with this passage and probably moved on to Isaiah 54, 55, and 56, when he hit 56... It would have been the best news this eunuch could ever imagine. Because in Isaiah 56 verse 4, it says this, To the eunuchs, it speaks directly to who this guy is, directly to his situation, to people like you, man from Ethiopia, who tried to get into the temple and couldn't get in, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple. He couldn't get in, and now this is declaring, you will get in. I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. Saying to those who are cut off, to those who feel like they don't belong, to those who feel like they don't have a seat at the table, to those who feel like outsiders. What Jesus is doing is he's making a way for you in. He's doing for, for you what you and your religious system couldn't. He's giving you a new name, a new identity, a legacy better than sons 
and daughters, a place at the table with Jesus and all His people. So you don't have to be dejected. You don't have to fear rejection, denial. You are brought in because of Him and what He has done for you, which means this is true not just for Him but for us today. And if there are those here this morning feeling cut off, the good news is that Jesus brings you in. He brings you into His family and makes you whole. And so what Philip does here is he tells him the good news, but he doesn't force the good news on him. Because as they go along the way, we read this in verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And what's so beautiful about this story is that all the way, through the whole thing, Philip trusts that God is leading the way, step by step. Philip doesn't force anything. He trusts that God is present and active and at work in this guy's life before he ever shows up. He doesn't force his way in. He simply follows the leading of the Spirit from the beginning, even when it doesn't make sense, even when he tells him to go to uncertain places, when he says, go south down this desert road to somewhere, he goes. He trusts that God is active and at work and present even before he got there. He doesn't have to push his way in. All he has to do is leave room for the Holy Spirit to prompt this guy to respond and be baptized, which means this. If you want to have lasting influence in somebody's life, it requires and depends on God's presence. Lasting influence depends on God's presence. It assumes that God is present and active, not only in my life, but in the lives of the people around me. And what my responsibility is, is to look out for that and respond. Uh, A a while back, I was um, in a situation here where there was an individual who was attending our church who just kind of was gone for a while. And I tried to reach out to them a couple of times and didn't connect with them at all and was thinking about them and was praying for them. And one morning, um, I got up to run and I remember walking out of the house and that person came to mind. And I was like, that's kind of out of the blue. And I had this thought, it'd be great if I saw them on this run. I mean, this is 5.30 in the morning, like in the middle of winter, like The only people outside are crazy people who feel the need to exercise at that time of day, right? I'm like, oh, huh. So I go, and part of my route was along the the, the parkway coming down the river, and there's all of these streets, right, that come and just dead end into the parkway. And I'm running down the parkway, and I see this person and this friend of theirs walking this way, and I look, and there was just something about that individual. I was like, could that be? And I'm just like dead-eyeing them. Fortunately, it's dark. They can't see that I'm staring at them. But it was like our paths crossed right at the same time. And it was that individual. And that morning, what the Spirit was doing was preparing my heart by calling them to mind and raising that thought, like, wouldn't it be great to see them on this run, to encounter them, to have a conversation with them and reconnect them and re-invite them back to our church. God is always present and at work, not only in your life, but in the lives of the people around you. Because she said, hey, I've been thinking about you, thinking we need to connect. I was like, absolutely. God is present and at work. My first Sunday back from sabbatical this fall was the preaching. I was just here. We had a very similar setup to we had this morning with, with musicians. And over the last year, we've had drummers kind of come and go. We've had certain drummers who serve, say, hey, I can't in this season of life. And so our, our drummer availability has just dwindled. And I remember thinking, like, God, like, send us more drummers. We need more drummers. So we go through the service and start meeting people. Some new people who I'd never met before come say hi to me. This young individual comes up. He introduces himself to me, not knowing that I was praying for anything. And he just says, hey, I'm so-and-so. I've connected with Nate, and I'm going to start drumming with the worship team. I'm like, God, you are present in this place. Like, you are present even when I'm not. Who would have thought, right? You are present and at work here all the time. Like, God is always present and always at work in your life, but also in the lives of the people around us all the time. And the question is, 
are we going to follow in the same way Philip follows, or are we going to push back, question, and resist? Because God is prompting you. He's leading you. Now, you may be asking the question, well, how do I know? Like, how do I know that God is prompting me and leading me into something that I should follow? Well, what happens to Philip? He is put in uncertain, uncomfortable, awkward situations. Situations that disrupt his sense of maybe what he wants to do. So if you find yourself in a situation where it's uncomfortable, awkward, and uncertain, there's a really good chance God might be inviting you into something. The question is, are you going to have the obedience that Philip has and step into that uncertainty and have an adventure with God or just stay where it's safe? and increase your own sense of certainty, but miss out on what he's doing in other people's lives. See, the, the call for us to, is to influence people wherever we go, because there's a world of people who are hurting, broken, and in need, and our call is to invite people to discover Jesus so they can become his fully devoted followers, and then they, along with us, can influence the world. And as we do that, as we carry the good news, we will find that it's more encouraging and more inspiring and more life-giving than we could ever imagine. And so the invitation is, would you join us on this journey? Would you be willing to step outside of your comfort zone, step outside of your sense of certainty to follow the leading of the Spirit wherever He goes? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your graciousness. We thank you so much for the leading of your spirit. Lord, we confess that sometimes we explain it away. We say, that just doesn't make sense. There is no way that could happen. But Lord, with you and your spirit, you have empowered us to have everything we need to be obedient and follow you step by step, moment by moment, day by day. And so we ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes to people in need, that you would give us ears that listen in mouths that are slow to speak, and that we would have a strong sense of certainty, not around our circumstances, but around you and who you are and what it is you extend to those in need. We pray this in your name. Amen.